Welcome to End of Life University on YouTube. Today I'm sharing with you an interview with hospice and palliative care physician, Dr. Aditi Sethi. I think you'll enjoy it. She talks all about her work and the Center for Living and Dying Consciously that she is starting near Asheville, North Carolina. So I hope you'll enjoy this interview. Be sure and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Also, subscribe and leave a rating and review wherever you happen to listen to the podcast. And if you're so inclined to chip in a few dollars a month to help keep this show on the air, go to eoluniversity.com slash support and find out three different ways you can make a financial contribution just to help me out. And I appreciate it very much. So now we'll move on with my interview with Aditi Sethi. Today, I am so very honored to welcome to the podcast my guest, Dr. Aditi Sethi. Dr. Sethi is a hospice and palliative care physician, end of life doula and musician. Featured in the forthcoming film, The Last Ecstatic Days, Aditi is an emerging and important voice for shifting our culture's understanding and approach to dying, death and bereavement care. Dr. Sethi is also the founder and executive director of the Center for Conscious Living and Dying near Asheville, North Carolina, and we'll be talking all about that. And you can learn more about the center at the website ccld.community. Uh, you can learn more about the film, The Last Ecstatic Days Movie.com. And then Aditi also has a music website, which is absolutely beautiful. So I would rec highly recommend it at aditimusic.com. So, Aditi, welcome and thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Karen. Uh, we've met each other virtually in the past, and so it's so it's kind of amazing for both of us to get to see each other through Zoom, at least face to face. So, uh, and I've really been looking forward to this conversation. Me too. And by virtual, you mean virtual reality, right? <laughs> virtual reality, yes, <laughs> virtual reality. Yeah, where we saw each other as bundles of light and energy. <laughs> So, uh, so I'd love to hear more about your story and what, how, what your journey has been first to becoming a hospice and palliative care physician, and then training as an end of life doula. And now you're opening a center for living and dying consciously. So would you kind of take us through this, um, your, your amazing journey so far? Thank you. Yeah. So I, the way I think when I reflect on my journey, I really notice one common thread, and it's this deep listening and following of my intuition. And so when people ask me why or how did you get involved with end of life care, or how did you become a hospice palliative care doc, it really, the truth is I just followed my impulse and my intuition, and I was guided there, and I I feel like it chose me. It was a beautiful fit and a beautiful merging of various aspects of my being as I continue to step forward. So in linear time, I was 17 in undergrad um, and I became a hospice volunteer. Um, and when I learned of hospice at this volunteer fair for incoming freshmen, there was a booth set up as the woman was telling me about death and sitting with people who are dying and learning how to be with death and those that are dying, it's just something in me felt like it was an alignment, deep resonance. I mean, you're, I'm not gonna be in this 17 year old body and with these insecurities forever. You mean I'm gonna die? <laughs> so but that's amazing really at such a young age. I don't hear that very often from people. Yeah, it's a blessing. Um, and I had been aware of the transient nature of this life um, from a young age. It was just part of my awareness. I was born in India, North India, and moved to Augusta, Georgia when I was three via London and Wales. And um, growing up in the South then, there weren't many Indian families. And when I would go back to India, I would notice how, um, how many people there were, how diverse um, in terms of socioeconomic statuses there were, and how much poverty and suffering there was. And I would return to the States and just look around and everything was so manicured and, and so much of life and death and aging were hidden from view. 
And so that, I think that left a big impression on me. And mm. suffering as well, hidden in general, because, you know, we, we keep people hidden away in hospitals and, and the general public don't see, don't see illness and suffering face to face. Right. Yeah. And so then as a volunteer throughout my um, college years, I was also really deeply seeking answers to the big questions. What, why are we here? What is this reality about? Is it really to work hard, make a lot of money, have a big house and a big car, nice car, um, and then have a good retirement so that I can leave money to my children, all of which are important and valuable, but is that all there is? So I asked those questions. I, I studied Tibetan Buddhism in Nepal and traveled to Africa. I was blessed to be able to do those things. And then I ended up choosing to go to medical school and um, really was in the observer role of how we deal with death. You know, um, as you know, <laughs> there was no formal curriculum at the time um, for death and dying. And I ended up doing a, an internship my summer after the summer after my freshman year of med, first year of medical school. And um, it was on end of life care through Amsterdam. Mm got to spend a month learning about hospice and I brought some of that knowledge back to my campus and did lunch and learns and so I've always kind of been an activist really if I look, look back um, and then uh, having witnessed and experienced pretty lonely isolated deaths throughout my training I realized that this is the work I want to be a part of you know, and help shift our cultural approach to it and then I ended up doing a hospice palliative care fellowship after my family medicine training. So I worked in an inpatient hospice for 10 years, which was beautiful here in Asheville. Hmm. That's wonderful. And then when did you decide to get to get training as a death doula? So after my um, first year of independence as an attending, you know, graduated residency, finished residency and started working on my own, it was really early on that I something hit me one day um, and it was watching people without family members pretty much lying around waiting to die in our facility. And their families were abroad. They were just, they had no place to go, no home. And I just experienced this gap. I witnessed this gap early on and realized that death isn't a medical event. It just sort of came to me. I didn't never thought of it other than, oh, of course, it's a medical event. It's when medicine doesn't serve you and it fails you, then you die. So it was just a big shift. And I knew that there's other ways, more traditional ways of being with death. And so early on in 2014, I called together a bunch of uh, artists, musicians, healers, um, some nurses and doctors to have a retreat. I said, what if we just vision what aging and dying could look like? Um, this is 2014. And out of that emerged this beautiful vision that I believe is a collective vision around this intergenerational village concept around aging and dying and, and you know, birth and all of it. And um, through that journey, we met regularly and I started having babies. I have three children and it just never really took form at that time. But each individual followed their heart, and one of them, Greg Lathrop, ended up becoming a doula and started teaching for the Conscious Dying Institute. And so I had, meanwhile, when I was having my child, I was birthing my child, I remember thinking, wow, I have a birth plan, this beautiful birth plan. And I get to be really intentional about the smells and the sounds and who's in the room. And I thought, everybody dying should have a birth plan. How wonderful would it be? And so little did I know there were doulas doing that and supporting people to create those. Simultaneously, Greg was doing his training. And so when I um, learned of his training and them him bringing it back to Asheville, I offered it in our home in this event space. So it, it found me again, that they hosted the first doula training at our home in Asheville. So I said, I'll take it. Wow. <laughs> and it was that. And it was so wonderful because I got to really integrate again, bring all these different aspects of myself to the experience, the training, and then beyond. So long answer to your question. Well, I was going to say, it just points out I, what you're, ta you're talking about, like our medical training and how lacking it is 
in teaching anything really about end of life unless you seek it out on your own as you did and I just it just struck me that you know medicine at some point kind of took over the dying process because it used to happen at home and it used to be an event at home where loved ones took care of their own dying at home and then medicine took took it over and brought it into the hospital but then ignored it then didn't didn't learn anything about death or how to care for someone dying and so it's like the dying process has been trapped within the medical system in a way and it feels like we're trying to free it up again now so that it can be more natural and and take place in in other places where it should be and not necessarily controlled and medicalized yeah and to really when people are making the choice when another thing i noticed was that in my 10 years of working in hospice the percentage of people that are are formally putting their wishes down on paper their advanced directives is still 35 30 percent it hasn't changed and so it made me realize wow i think the conversation needs to happen on a community level and amongst our friends and our family members you know, it's not the medical system's responsibility necessarily, or nor will they have capacity to initiate these conversations. And I think what we're seeing is this wave, this movement of excitement. I, um, a woman just came from LA today to, or yesterday to host a death over draft over beer. Talk about mm. death over beer and death cafes and death over dinner. And you know, people are hungry for these conversations. So. It's so true. It's so true. I see it. And I think that COVID may really have accelerated that hunger in some ways because a lot of people woke up to death and dying. They had loved ones die or become seriously ill. And, and for the first time, seeing so much death taking place around the world, it, it was very hard to ignore it over the last two years. So I, I think that has pushed the shift to happen a little bit faster. And I also wonder about that, having seen so many isolated families, family units, you know, in terms of the family who's the family member who's dying, the inability to be close to loved ones. And that was tragic to, for me to witness, but I also understood it. And yet I wanted to create, I want to be a part of alternatives to, if we have another pandemic where people don't have to die alone. There's some element of choice with public safety in mind, public health in mind, but there's got to be a balance. Yeah. And I, th I really think this pandemic exposed all the weaknesses and the flaws of our medical system and what we do not do well at all. And yes, there's some great, wonderful aspects to our medical system and some things we're very, very good at, but uh, anything related to end of life, we we are so far behind in a way there's so much that that we need to change and that we need to improve upon but i guess that's what i mean you and i i think both feel passionate about that we both feel inspired that we want to try to change our profession on the one hand if we can <laughs> i don't know how i don't know how possible that is but make our own way of helping our communities change as well mm -hmm. yeah i think when we talk about changing our profession, I think my path moving forward or my uh, where I feel like I would like to get involved within the medical system is to really work with individual practitioners to help them sit with the reality of their own death. And I think Atul Gawande did a great job being mortal, you know, mm -hmm. starting the conversation. And um, yeah, I think it's, there's a lot to do. But even just the beginning with that, each individual student, maybe. Yeah. It, yeah, it's so true. Also, because every every medical provider at some point or another will face death and dying personally in a loved one, for a loved one or for themselves if they get a diagnosis. And that's kind of the teachable moment. I remember always learning about that um, in, in yeah. medicine, that people sometimes they reach a teachable moment when for the first time their minds are open and their hearts are open and they're ready to learn. And so so maybe like we, we do have to wait for those moments because as you said, it's a little bit shocking that we haven't moved the needle very much on advanced care planning over all the time that we've been talking about it and trying to work toward it. So. Um, maybe the teachable moments hadn't come yet, so people weren't that receptive to it. Right. And I wonder if the statistics will change um, after COVID. 
what what we'll find now if more yeah. in the conversations that's true because the statistics always lag behind a few years yeah. so we haven't really seen the impact yet mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to have a, a conversation with you because your center is called the Center for Conscious Living and Dying. And so I just wanted to talk about that for listeners about what what is meant by conscious living and how does someone live consciously and then how does that help them die consciously as well? Hmm. So the word conscious to me means awareness with awareness to be awake to have your eyes wide open that's how i think of the word conscious not in the medical term of state of consciousness right yes yes but, but it is awake and aware and not the physiologic sense but also the spiritual emotional sense and what it means to me to live a conscious life is to live a life where there is a mindfulness and awareness of how we are in relation with ourselves and others and to be very intentional about our actions our speech our way of being in the world and its impact and that includes reflection on our reactions to things that happen to us, how we relate to one another, how we love, how we fear, all of it. Um, and really taking time and taking, making space in our lives to be with ourselves and really look at who we are without all the conditioned responses. And to me, conscious dying is just that. It's living and walking towards death with an awareness of all the aspects of life and all the aspects of letting go all the aspects of grief that come with that 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 path towards death so different cultures have different religious perspective different religions have perspectives on consciousness at the time of death and that's not really what i mean when i say conscious dying um but it's just dying with awareness and eyes wide open. Mm, I love that. And it, it made me picture when you were describing going to visit India and coming back here to the US and it almost seems as if collectively in our Western society here, people are more asleep instead of being awake and aware people have preferred if, in a way to stay asleep maybe and not have to face the challenges and the difficulties of life until until they're forced to until something happens that they cannot cannot ignore it any longer. Yeah, it's, there's a there's a band-aid approach to life there's a numbing out approach to life all of which you know has a place and and, is, and there's no judgment but for me that's that hasn't been um that approach to life has not served those who are dying in their families so i have found that people who really have conversations early on prepare for death create a dying experience that reflects how they have lived their lives or or how they want to be remembered that really serves their their loved ones after death versus a crisis driven response a eyes closed let's ignore it last minute let's do our will when it's too late so mm -hmm. that creates a whole nother <laughs> experience yeah and and it has occurred to me being in the medical system that our, our medical system really fosters that band-aid approach crisis driven approach that you are talking about as well and is um, plenty willing to supply medications to help keep people numb and and asleep instead of helping them accept the realities of what's happening in life and i think that's one of the things that frustrated me the most about being a doctor in our medical system is feeling i was constantly fighting against the culture of medicine and the the prevailing standards of care in a way that that just seemed to be oriented in the wrong direction to me seemed to be covering up instead of instead of opening people up and then helping them cope with what's true and real about life mm -hmm. yeah 
Um, I'm curious if are there certain practices that you recommend for people who are trying to become more conscious about life and death? Um, I didn't pre prepare you for this <laughs> question, yeah. but it just occurred to me that maybe we could talk about that, what people can do as they're trying to wake up and um, what might help them get more comfortable with death. Yeah. Well, I think it's the, a simple practice is focusing on the breath and just slowing down enough to really pay attention. That, that alone centers, like, stills the nervous system, kind of shifts the energy, um, the energetics of your being. And I feel like that practice, you know, breath practice or mindfulness practice is a good place to start. And a mindfulness practice could be that simple as just focusing on the in-breath and the pause between and then the out-breath. I also feel a gratitude practice is really so just powerful. Um, if we really pause to take a moment and think about what a miracle this human existence is, and then take a look at nature and just sit with that, for even a moment a day, it can really have an impact. So, and then that, as we shift our awareness and bring mindfulness to our moments, waking moments, you can't help but pay attention when things that don't serve you or your family are in the way of your living, your highest self and living in alignment with who you are and what you're doing here. So let's start mm. there. That's, that's really beautiful. I love um, talking about nature because it's all around us and all we have to do is to go outside and look at a blade of grass or look at a flower growing in your neighbor's garden. And if you stop and look closely, it's amazing. And uh, it just helps you feel connected to life in a sense, but then you realize, oh, this will also die one day because that's part of the cycle. That's how it all works. And it's, I think that nature connection can be really helpful to us. I think take, it's just slowing down in our culture. We move so fast. And so I think taking a moment to just slow down and pay attention. Yeah. And appreciate, like you said. Yeah, it's true. We have so many options for keeping ourselves distracted all the time, continuously, our phones and our computers and our television sets and that, you know, we can constantly be putting things into our brain but so we have to intentionally decide to just be still and and go more slowly yeah and i think that being with death i feel kind of puts you in that state whether you want to be or not and i find that senses are heightened awareness is heightened people really a lot of stuff comes up in that experience and then and the more we can be with those emotions and allow them to move through us, the more connected we are to life, really, versus the opposite. It's people are afraid of the pain that will come up with grief, for example, and rather than not experiencing it, if they just feel it all, it can actually make them feel so alive and vibrant. <laughs> it, it's so true. I, um, I was remembering a patient who told me that he was actually grateful for his terminal diagnosis because it was the first time in his life that he was still, that he, he couldn't constantly be on the go, running around doing things and trying to control everything in his life. And the first time that he actually just had to be in one place and sit and that allowed him to open up to so many so many thoughts, but so many sensory experiences and emotions that he'd just been shutting away before and ignoring. So, yeah. And I, I, I'm really, I know we're going in different directions here, but I'm so interested in the psychedelic assisted therapy and the research around that in the face of, in the end of life setting and um, just what it does for our awareness and our experience of life. And I think there are tools, like you said, about practices, I think there are tools we can use to help us access that, you know, that um, space. It's so very true. And especially when time is limited, 
Um, and we would like to help someone get to that space sooner rather than in the last hours of life. If, if you know, if that's when it could happen, I think you're, you're right. I'm excited about the tools that are out there and seeing them be developed and, and uh, watching to see what a difference that make for, for, makes for people helping them with their anxiety and their fear. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that to, to die consciously, if we have lived our lives consciously, it seems to me that we will naturally approach dying consciously as well. It seems that we, we won't lose what we've learned in our conscious living practices. Um, I, but I can't, I can't say that for myself. I don't know that yet, but it seems <laughs> that way that ideally the earlier in life we learn to live consciously, the better off we'll be when we do come to the end of life. Yeah, I think it helps. It's a practice. You know, I've heard the people say how you live is how you die. And I haven't seen that to always be true. I've seen people who've not been, just like you said, at the end of life in those last final hours, there can be significant transformation and awareness of, wow, I was too busy, you know, the, the, the regrets of the dying, you've, you've heard of those. And so I worked too hard. I didn't love enough, you know, those sorts of things. So I think to die consciously, you don't necessarily have to practice, but it definitely helps. And it actually makes the journey much more rewarding in my experience and from my perspective. Yeah. Um, so yes, there's value in looking at these things before you're diagnosed with a terminal illness or facing death of a loved one. Yeah. Well, I know you are starting the Center for Conscious Living and Dying, and I wanted you to tell us more about that and what it consists of and what your dreams and goals are for the center. Thank you for the opportunity. So the Center for Conscious Living and Dying, I'll call it CCLD for short. It's a nonprofit and it emerged out of a desire to support this cultural shift that I feel is happening collectively, globally, um, and to also kind of bring death back to our communities and to, to individuals and not um, necessarily to professionals. So there are, one aspect of CCLD is direct care for those who are in their dying process. And that is based on this model of um, care called the Omega Home model. And there's the Omega Home Network. And these homes popped up in the 80s around the, during the AIDS crisis. And they're basically community supported end of life care homes. And uh, everyone involved or everyone served in those homes is is in hospice so hospice comes into the home this home just becomes the residence and volunteers become extended family and so that is the model and state by state there are different regulations and some are licensed in some states in our state if we have less than four people three or less individuals and we don't charge for services we don't have to be licensed or regulated so we're just a residence um, and then we'll have a, a group of volunteers who learn how to be with others who are in their dying process. So that's a big part of what we're doing. And it's again, at no charge to the one who's in the in the bed in the bed. Um, and then there's a, a education component where there is there are offerings in our community, our churches, our schools, this is the vision, and workshops and retreats so people can actually contemplate and prepare. Um, for their deaths and live consciously. So there's the the options for what we can do is so large because conscious living, you know, is so broad, which is exciting. Um, and one of the things I noticed, uh, I've noticed over the years is I've had many friends come and say to me, I've done a doula training, but I have no experience, hands-on experience, and where can I get it? And there's really no place. Um, that I could guide them to. And so one option, one thought we've had in terms of revenue generation is creating an apprenticeship model where people can come and be with us and learn with us um, at the bedside. And I'm really excited about the culture we're creating too, um, because so much of 
being with death is really learning to be with ourselves and examine our own life. And so, so much of that will be woven into our, our teaching. Mm, that's so beautiful. And I love that you're filling in a gap that I witnessed happening for hospice for patients who don't have a caregiver at home or maybe don't have a home that is suitable for them to receive end of life care who sometimes just get left out. They can't access the hospice services. And um, that just felt so tragic to me when that would happen. And in, in this case, they just needed a place to live. They just needed a suitable residence and they needed some someone there who could assist them and, and be a caregiver. So this is such a beautiful solution to a problem that's that's been there for a while in our current hospice system. Yeah. And you know, there's certain requirements to, for example, people say, oh, there's an inpatient hospice in my community, which is a wonderful service if you get to, if you're lucky to have one. But there are guidelines, Medicare and insurance um, guidelines that dictate who can be there and for how long, oftentimes. And so you're not guaranteed a bed in that space, in that facility. Similarly, if you don't have caregiving support in the home and don't have uh, means to hire help, I've, had, I've known people who have to go to a nursing home in their final days because they just don't have the support they need. So... There's definitely a gap, and I'm, I'm, I trust that these models and there, it's the idea is for this to be reproduced in other communities, and there are probably 80 uh, homes in, de, in 40 in development and 40 in operation around our country. So it'd be ideal that every community creates a home like this, or any other community that wants one. <laughs> I would love to see that happen. It would, it would make such a difference, and I'm sure there's a need everywhere there are people everywhere who could utilize such services of a home and i think of how we would be normalizing then this community focused death and dying wherever we are because people would be fundraising they'd be attending events to help raise money for the home and they would know people who had been in the home and they would come to visit and it would just uh, it would bring death and dying back into the community where it belongs Mm. Yeah, and I'm finding that people are so hungry for not only community, but spirit-centered community, a shared vision, a shared purpose. And um, it's been really beautiful to watch this community in Asheville come together already in these early stages. Yeah, that's really exciting. And, and I can definitely see the potential for all the education that could spring from it and could be could be supported by by having the home there but also could help support the home in exchange as you know as people come in to uh, to learn and just to be be more acquainted with death and dying yeah and i think i'm feeling that it's so critical right now that we get creative and ways of caring for each other, ways of caring for our aging population, ways of caring for individuals who are caregiving. We know that there's such a, an immense um, toll. It's, it's a, it can be a burden as well um, for caregivers. And um, so if any way we can support those, all those individuals, um, I think it's imperative really. And so, you know, traditionally nonprofits struggle quite a bit in their early stages, and there's a lot of dependency on fundraising and donations, all of which, um, like you said, if you can get creative, even with that, some of that is outreach while you're fundraising. But what if, and this is what we're exploring as our, as our, our team, our, a team, we are exploring creative ways of, of using the best of for-profit entities and non-profit entities and bringing it all together so we can be sustainable. So that, it's an experiment. <laughs> yeah, which is crucial. And, and I love your emphasis on creativity because I really do believe that we need all sorts of creative ideas to come to light right now. And we've seen um, our, I think our hospice concept is a little bit battered in this country. I mean, and, and we're finding again, limitations of hospice and things hospice just can't do and provide. And in, in some ways it's been taken over a little bit by 
the private sector, I think, and to to its to its detriment in many ways. And so, so we just we have to keep trying new things and coming up with new ideas. And I feel really excited about this concept. But but how far along are you in the process? Do you have a home, or is that still in development? Oh, Karen, we have this incredible property that is about 10 miles from Asheville. It's, I say it's so close yet worlds away. It's very accessible. It's close to this beautiful college called Warren Wilson College on acres and acres. That, the college is on this in this beautiful valley and the property is a, um, it's a home, a residential home and has mountain views and it's just stunning and it, it's sort of a portal when you drive in it's just magical and with community support and with spearheaded by a beloved friend david case we've acquired the property and the nonprofit hasn't purchased it but it's being supported and secure it's secured for us to use with the intent that the more we do the work eventually we'll be able to buy it Potentially. So it's again, it's in an LLC, but the nonprofit is using it. So again, using those entities to serve. It's creative partnership, which that's really important. Yeah. And we have a beautiful collaboration with Warren Wilson College forming one of their students, a big part of their um, what they do is engage students in their communities. And so it's so beautiful to walk in distance and it's just exciting to think of students. Again, that intergenerational piece. I'm getting involved with the land, you know, the caretaking of the land and maybe even direct care. It's exciting. Oh, that's wonderful. So just as you experience kind of the life-changing connection with death at that age to be able to offer that and make it available to other college students. I think that's really mm. wonderful. I didn't even make that connection until you just mentioned it. Thank you. Yeah. And it's beautiful. There's where it would be lovely if we could make a trail heading in that direction, you know, to connecting the two and creating a altars along the way and, you know, sort of a legacy garden for grief and there's so much potential. Mm. Mm. How wonderful. Well, I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned Omega House. Are there resources available for other communities who might be thinking they'd like to start something like this? Is there, should we refer them to a website or a place where they can get information? Yeah, so the Omega Home Network is, um, they are incredibly generous and giving of their time and energy. And they have so many resources that have helped me tremendously to get this going. Um, CCLD also eventually would, We'd like to share this with other communities. Um, so, but starting with the Omega Home model, if you want to get started, that's a good place to go. And they're very lovely. Okay. Yeah, that's really wonderful. I just find sometimes when we when we put seeds of these ideas out there, there are almost always someone listening who says, "That's what that's what I want to do. That's what my community needs." And it, it seems to me this could work if there are people like with a house that they've inherited and they don't know what to do with it. If there's a way, I, I'm sure the homes have to be retrofitted because they have to meet certain standards. I don't know for houses. State, but... state by state regulations. Yeah. But oh. still, if, if someone had a house that they to donate to a cause such as this, it would be amazing. Yeah. There may not be many renovations. It depends. Cause again, I, um, through the Omega Home Network, I met Karen Cassidy at the Hildegard House in Louisville, Kentucky. And she graciously gave me you know, all her time and energy one day. And she, every time I would come across something, and you'd appreciate this, Karen, like how, how do volunteers give medication? Like, how is that allowed, you know, legal, right? And she said, what would you do in your own home? And she kept bringing me back to, what would you do in your own home? Would you make the door sizes, you know, standard work for something or, or you, you know, no, the answer is you make it work. You, you know, you find your way to adapt. And yes, if you need to bring in equipment that's necessary, of course, you'll do that. But really, it's just a home and we're extended family. Yeah. And, and for the most part, we're talking about 
non-medical deaths here that wouldn't require a lot of equipment. I mean, because we'll already be furnished with beds and the basic things that people need. So oh, that's that's really good to know and really reassuring. So some some of the obstacles we might imagine um, are not really there or can be overcome at least. It's how yeah, we look and at it. State by state, there's different regulations and guidelines. So some states would require licensure, which would mean there's some more regulations and you might have to pay attention. Um, and some of these models supplement some of the volunteer care with uh, RN and CNA support. But even that, as we've seen, you know, the, the great resignation is a real thing. I've seen inpatient hospices have to close because they can't find their night, night nurses. And so that's another example where the need for creativity is imperative if we're going to keep caring for people. That it's non-medical end of life care, essentially, is what we're talking about. Using the existing hospice structures and systems and and kind of um, and collaborating, really. It's not one yeah. of and given that in many ways we've over medicalized care of the dying in the past, so we can step back from some of that. It isn't all necessary and um, use our resources better to help more people. And to really work with hospices to provide some of the care that hospices can't. Exactly. The common thing I hear is, oh, I thought when I got hospice involved, I would have more support. Mm -hmm. They have their team hospice comes in to the home or a residence wherever you are a nursing home but offers a nurse once a week and a cna two to three times a week if if you're lucky and um it's an incredible service but it's you still require 24 7 caregiving by somebody family yeah family. yeah and and i'm being told that each hospice staff member has a much higher caseload now than they used to carry in the past so even the time they do have to give to patients and families may feel like pressed, you know, they, they're, they're stretched thin. And so we definitely need to be able to augment that and, uh, and offer other, other care volunteers and volunteer caregivers. Yeah. So, oh, I feel so excited about this model and very exciting that you're creating it before our eyes and <laughs> that uh, it, it will, it's, it's going to be a reality, I'm sure of that. Yes. And uh, I look forward to getting to come there someday. Thank you. And, and see what you've created. Oh, I'd love for you to come visit these mountains. It's beautiful here. It sounds like it. Okay. You know, I was really inspired by the care of Ethan Sisser. I think I mentioned him to you. Oh, yeah. Um, talk about that because he is in the movie, The Last Ecstatic, Last, The Last Ecstatic Dan Days. Okay. I <laughs> like Last Ecstatic Days. We do have a lot of ecstatic dance in this area. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so he had, he was a 36 year old um, with a glioblastoma and he was diagnosed in 2019, right before the pandemic. And this is a soul who had such a rich life, um, traveled to India and learned belly dancing, studied Thai massage, was living in Hawaii. Um, just an incredible being. And when the pandemic hit, he became more isolated in Brooklyn. He was in New York at the time. And he started documenting his journey with the cancer on social media just to help people feel less afraid, maybe, perhaps you feel less alone. And so a friend of mine in Asheville, Jojo, had been following him on social media. And as it became clear that Ethan's treatments weren't working, Ethan ended up moving to Charlotte, which is about two hours from Asheville, to be with his father. And he was enrolled in a hospice, inpatient hospice facility. And he was streaming all his you know, all his experiences still. And he, he said on, in, on the screen, he said, I have been told I'm dying. I want a community. I want to manifest a community to surround me. And I want to film my dying process to wow. yeah, alleviate some of the fear that exists around it. So Jojo heard that call and he called me as the hospice doc in Asheville and community organizer. And he called my friend Scott Kirschenbaum, who a week prior had just started working with Jessica Zitter, a woman I've admired for a while. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
And everything just sort of came again into alignment. It was this moment of, oh, this soul needs my help, our help. And we all rallied. So we got him from Asheville to Charlotte to Asheville within two days. They wouldn't allow filming in the unit I was working in. So we got him to a home in two days, rallied a whole community of people to support his dying process. And the film crew came out and it was just a magical whirlwind <laughs> journey. Wow. So we did a home funeral and a green burial. And yeah, it was all captured and it's being created into this beautiful film honoring his life, his consciousness, mm. conscious dying, really. Oh, that's so, so beautiful. I can't wait to see it. And we've already planned that we're going to have another interview just to talk about the film. And it sounds like it will be coming out sometime in 2023, we hope earlier in the year. So, um, so we will meet again to have a conversation about that beautiful film. Is are the the vid the videos that Ethan created are they available on YouTube still? Is there a channel or? Yeah, there's a We Three connection. I think it's called a Facebook page, and then the Last Ecstatic Days movie has a pa Facebook page, and you can actually there's lots of beautiful posts of his clips of his videos. And yeah, that, that's a good place to start. Um, I believe he still has an active website. He did many podcast interviews during his journey and um, such a, an eloquent, honest, real being. He's so vulnerable in front of all of us. It was really inspiring. Hmm. It's interesting because right now at this moment, I know of three different people with glioblastomas and um, I'm sure who could really benefit just from hearing about Ethan's journey or the wisdom he had to share um, and what he wanted them to know, because it sounds like that's what he was inspired by to, to pass on things he'd been learning. So true. Yeah. Yeah. That was his, that's his legacy for sure. Mm. Wow. That must've been a really profound experience. I can, I can imagine. Yeah, for me, it was one of the most transformative experiences of my life. And all I can tell you is when I committed to supporting him, I just, everything shifted for me. It was, again, it was one of those moments of alignment, I should say. It wasn't so much a shift as this awakening moment of, ah, and as he was taking his last breath, I was sitting in the other room and it was so clear to me, I have to leave my job, which I loved, and step into this next chapter. I have no choice. This is what's being asked of me. So I did. I put my notice on right wow. now. <clears throat> wow. So experiencing his death was, was like an introduction or a precursor in a way to the center for, for conscious living and dying. It definitely put CCLD into um, on a different trajectory. And I had never even heard of the Omega Home Network until after Ethan's passing. And I researched all these different models out there and I came across it because I was, what we did for Ethan was community supported end of life care yes. and created an experience for him that really reflected his life that we couldn't do in the inpatient hospice house because for various reasons. For, yeah, yeah. Powerful it's experience. again it's the creativity that you brought to that situation that the moment calls for it the patient and their experience and what they're going through and where you are where you're located but it sort of brings the right people together to help provide the care and then creates this this creates something of beauty when you all come together and so that's a great example of how when we stay in that that state of curiosity and creativity, we can be inspired to do things we never would have figured out on our own. We never would have made that happen on our own. It had to just arise and be offered to us. So eloquently put, yes, that's what it felt like. So it's just a great reminder for everyone out there listening that we need to stay in that space of openness and, and curiosity and watch for those nudges we get or our, our intuitive guidance that says this would be this is something for you to work on give your time to this give your energy to this because um, that's how we're really going to change things i think 
in our medical system, in our world, in our communities. Right. And it's not without, it doesn't come without fear, but it's putting fear in, the, in its place. Mm. So, as the fear arises when you're following your impulse, if it's not what you expected to do or um, feel you are, expect, you are um, expected to do, <laughs> um, then trusting, trusting that impulse. Hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. And remembering when you feel the fear, it doesn't mean something's wrong or you made the wrong choice. That's normal. It's part of the process, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I am um, in the, during the Ethan journey, I call it. <laughs> I just was guided. I had all these knowings and my mind wasn't, a, wasn't getting in the way. So when I discharged him from hospice, the hospice I worked for as his doctor, I became his death doula. Mm -hmm. And I didn't question anything around, is that okay? It just, I followed my heart and impulse and it was the right thing to do. Um, but That's then I beautiful. could a lawyer after. <laughs> I was worried. <laughs> the fear came up after and I said, did I do anything wrong here? <laughs> she said, <"Hey." laughs> I love how seamlessly those flowed together you know, those parts of your being, parts of your identity. And uh... yeah, and even putting in my notice without a plan is not like me, it's not like me. You know, as being going through med school, everything is laid out for us. We know what we're going to do from high school to college, you know, when you're going to take what exam to get you to the next space and next step and with this journey, it was leaping into the unknown. I did, I did have a, a, a similar experience um, of kind of getting the nudge and an intuition that I, I, need, I'm, I need to do something else. There's another track for me. I'm supposed to be doing something else. And it was when I left practice to write a book and start writing and teaching and then doing interviews like this. But it came loud and clear and I knew it was for right now. It isn't something, oh, think about that for two years from now. It was, no, this is today. You need to make a change. So I, I felt that same nudge and that impulse to take a leap without having any idea what I was actually going to be doing. <laughs> wow, that's inspiring. So it does work that way for us sometimes, these, these intuitions. They push us. <laughs> yeah, and it was interesting. Somebody on the board of CCLD asked me early on, if you knew you were going to fail, would you continue to do what you're doing for CCLD? And without hesitation, I said, of course, yes. I'm willing to take that risk for what I believe in. And of course. Yeah, of course. And because there's so much to learn, even from failures, even from detours or, you know, a dead end, we learn by shifting course then and figuring out something new. Yeah. Well, I want to remind our listeners that I'm talking to Dr. Aditi Sethi, and we've been talking about the Center for Conscious Living and Dying near Asheville, North Carolina, that is happening before our eyes and uh but also just about all of your lovely work aditi and i'm so excited that we get to talk again uh hopefully sooner rather than later about uh the last the last ecstatic days movie that will be coming up so you can go to ccld.community to learn more about the Center for Conscious Living and Dying. Go to aditimusic.com to listen to some very beautiful music because you, you are you play multiple instruments, right, Aditi? I saw harp, harmonium, and keyboard. Mm -hmm. Piano and a little bit bass of the bass. And you sing, you have a beautiful voice. That's amazing. So um, go and, and listen to some very peaceful, inspiring music <laughs> and um and then we'll be we'll be coming together again before too long to talk about the movie when when it's ready to come out so thank you so much aditi for joining me today thank you karen such a pleasure yeah it's, it's been wonderful to talk with you and see see you see your face <laughs>
I hope you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Aditi Sethi. I'm so inspired by the idea of a non-medical residence for patients at the end of life. I love what she's creating. I can't wait to see it get off the ground. And so I'm excited to share this inspiration, hoping that more people will want to create homes in a similar fashion in their communities. It's so important. And also I love talking about living and dying consciously, which is what all of us need to be aspiring toward. And that's really what my work is about, trying to help people be in a place where they can not only live their lives more consciously, but prepare for the end of life. So thanks again for joining me today. And remember to subscribe, as I asked before, and leave a rating and review. I appreciate you so much. We'll see you the next time.